Thanks, Mel. And also let us know if you can't hear us or anything else we should be aware of throughout the presentation. Uh, so we can actually go to the next slide and do some introductions here as we get started. I'm sure some of us know others and some of us don't know some of you. So we wanted to just share who we were and then we'll get started with what we uh, plan to present today. So my name is Molly Mowry and I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called the Community Wildfire Planning Center. We are based in Colorado. We will work very closely with Eagle County and BBR to support the Real Fire program, uh, as well as some other activities, which Eric will talk more about. And we work with other communities across the Western US to support their efforts on wildfire risk reduction. Uh, Mike Budd is with us today, as I'm sure many of you know Mike, and he is one of our directors as well. And just um, also wanted to say thanks to Mel and the Vail Board of Realtors for the opportunity to be here today and present on some of the work we do and, and more broadly on wildfire risk uh, to communities. Eric? Thanks, Molly. Uh, my name is Eric Lovgren. I'm the Wildfire Mitigation Coordinator in Eagle County, and I run the Real Fire Property Assessment Program as it exists here. Um, and have since 2016 when we launched. I'm also responsible for the implementation of the county's wildfire regulations as they apply to new development and building in our wildland urban interface. Um, and a handful of other duties here, including um, working in our emergency operations center as the planning section lead during fires. And I am the chairman of uh, the board of directors for Fire Adapted Colorado, a statewide network connecting practitioners like Molly and I to each other so that we can share best practices and, and network better. So John. Hey everyone, uh, my name is John Morse. I'm a local insurance agent here based out of uh, Edwards. Uh, in addition to Liberty Mutual, I represent about 10 other companies here in the state of Colorado. Um, some have some intimate knowledge with both the underwriting side on each one, kind of the appetites and what uh, some companies don't want to insure and, and what kind of helps get better rates or uh, discounts on homeowners policies as well. Great. Thanks, John and Eric. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please, Mel. So just in brief, what the three of us plan to cover today is giving you a sense of a quick sense of the 2020 wildfires in review. And then Eric will segue more into the Colorado wildfire context and where we're at for 2021, as well as how Eagle County is and has been responding to wildfire threats. In that section, we'll talk a lot more about the real fire program as well. So we definitely hope you walk away from today's course with a good understanding of real fire. Also, John will be talking though about insurance considerations for mitigation. We've had insurance topics in the past and we've, um, we've seen that there's been a lot of interest in better understanding how the insurance piece fits into wildfire. And then we'll close the lecture portion with discussing more broader future trends and uncertainties when it comes to planning for wildfires and how it may affect the real estate market. And then at the end, we have we always leave a lot of time for Q&A and discussion. So if you do have a chat uh, question along the way, please feel free to put it in the chat. But we've reserved a lot of time for all of your questions and a bigger group discussion at the end. Um, and again, there will be ample time for that. So let's jump into it. We can start with you know, last year really was a record breaking year for wildfires in the Western US. Um, every year we have uh, wildfires anywhere on average from about 50,000 to 70,000 wildfires. That's typical. Um, the majority of these are human caused, although this varies by region somewhat. So for example, in the Southeast, almost 100% of wildfires are human caused, whereas in areas of the West and Pacific Northwest, we have a lot more lightning caused fires as well. But what was truly unique about 2020 was one, was the size of some of these fires, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, also the communities affected across the West, we saw a lot more small towns being affected. Another unique aspect of last year was the extended fire season. 
And then of course, uh, what was very unique was the fact that we were in a pandemic and there were some new challenges, some unique response challenges that many fire departments had to navigate through in their response. Next slide. So a quick snapshot of just some communities uh, across the West that were affected by wildfires. One uh, was including the Bab Malden fire in Washington state, which you may have heard about. It only, I say only, it, it burned about 15,000 acres, but it destroyed about 80% of the town of Malden. And this was during a fast moving event over Labor Day. Next slide. And what was also um, perhaps more devastating about this wildfire is that it burned not just homes, a significant number of the town's homes, but also 94 other structures, which included the town's city hall and their local fire station and post office. So it was an extremely significant impact for that town. Next slide. So also in September last year, we saw large portions of two other towns called Phoenix and Talent, which were in Oregon, get almost complete dis completely destroyed as well. This is a picture from the Almeda fire, which started in Jackson County, which is in Southwest Oregon. If you've been ever to um, Ashland, for example, it's not far from that community. So strong winds pushed this fire north along a bike path, which was parallel to the interstate and it was burning power poles along the way and blackberry vines and eventually it burned homes. It, um, in total, it burned, again, smaller sized fire, 3,200 acres, but it destroyed 3,000 structures, um, including one of the fire district's three firehouses. Uh, you can see in the upper right image is, um, it, it's an image of the fire perimeter that shows this linear pattern along the highway. So these are just a couple examples of where, you know, we can think more broadly about some of the areas that may be at risk to fire, not necessarily traditional areas that are in densely forested um, terrain. Next slide. So it's probably also no surprise that California also experienced um, its largest fire in, hist in state history. And when we're talking about records being broken last year, California was included. Um, this particular fire that was the largest in fire in state history is what's called the August Complex. And it burned more than 1 million acres and almost a thousand structures. Um, I should point out again, and I know I'm saying this a few times, but Size doesn't always, size of fire doesn't always equate to damage, uh, damages for structures lost. So for example, the tunnel fire, which occurred in Oakland Hills in 1991, only burned 1600 acres, but it destroyed almost 3000 structures. So just want to make sure that message gets across that size of fire and damage are not always directly proportional. Next slide. <clears throat> And meanwhile, of course, uh, for those of us all in Colorado, we experienced the state's three largest fires recorded in terms of acres burned. Um, one of the fires was the Grizzly Creek Fire, which burned along the major transportation route, as we all know, I-70, and it shut down the highway and disrupted um, many of our local supply chains that went across and through the state. So Eric will talk about this fire in a moment. And next slide. He'll also talk about this one as well, which, whoops, if you want to go back, thanks, Mel. Um, so this was actually a picture outside of my office window. I, I'm in Littleton, Colorado, so I'm on the front range. And um, it was an October evening, and I was working somewhat late into the evening. This was well, late, it was around six o'clock, and I had my head down all day, and I looked up, and I couldn't believe this large smoke plume that I was seeing um, because really I didn't know that any fires were that active at that time. And so, you know, even those of us that work in wildfire continue to sometimes get surprised by what we're seeing um, in the past few years with the type of rapid fire activity that can start one day. And in this case, you know, within a 24 hour period, the fire, as you may know, you know, grew by 100,000 acres. This was the East Troublesome fire. So I'm going to turn it over to 
um, have Eric talk more about this fire and, and going back to the Grizzly Creek fire and any other fires around Colorado that really affected us last year. And again, set us up for what we're thinking and, and starting to um, prepare for, for this fire season in 2021. I feel like you should play some dun 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 music on the transition, but I'm, I will try to keep it light, as light as as can be done with this. So, as Molly, and thank you, Molly. That was a that was a great intro, and I think very few people in the state, uh, at least all of us along the I-70 corridor, even into Garfield County, and everyone around the Front Range, got to see this fire, and. It is troublesome for a variety of reasons. It's the 100,000 acres in a 24 hour burn period, that has never happened here before. Embers traveling up and over the Continental Divide and starting new fires, both on Troublesome and Cameron Peak, that has also never happened before. The second driest day on record in the state of Colorado was recorded in Denver. <clears throat> and we can nerd out on the, the, the numbers behind that, but these are all very, very troublesome trends to me. The three largest fires in the state's history all just happened less than 12 months ago. But in fact, if you take the 20 largest fires in Colorado's history, well, they've all happened over the last 20 years. So just kind of sit and let that one land on you for a minute. <clears throat> and we think about the impacts to our, our resources, to the, all of the families and whose homes were lost, to the lives that were lost, to the millions and millions of dollars that were spent on fire suppression and then the harder to track costs of things like, you know, closing interstate commerce through the Glenwood Canyon for two weeks or evacuating 3,000 people from Estes Park. <clears throat> were the impacts of wildfire on the state really can't be overstated at this point. And I would say that if we were talking about this as our panel before everyone jumped on, it does have a feel of two different situations right now where the front range is somewhat green and had a pretty wet spring and it's a late snow and um, it's hard for those people to really track with what's going on up here. Most of Eagle County is still in an exceptional drought status, extreme to exceptional drought status and running out of ways to classify how dry it is when you get out onto the western slope. And of course, all those people are are pushing their way here as quickly as they can most weekends and the 4th of July will be here in no time. So human caused ignitions, uh, lightning caused ignitions, all of what are in the, in the forecast for us as we move into the summer. So you, you can just kind of lay awake at night and stare at the ceiling and panic about chains dragging on trucks or fire bottle rockets shooting into the woods or idiots with cigarettes. Or I would argue you take the time to, to, um, begin to develop a way to, to live with wildfire. Let, let's, let's skip on to the next slide, Mel. Again, we're seeing as a factor of, um, well, a variety of things. We have sort of fire regimes that are out of whack in Colorado and throughout the West due to, in some situation, fire suppression, right? We're very good at putting out little fires, and but the sum total of putting out every little fire is that you set yourself up for really big fires. And then of course we have more and more people pushing further into the woods. And that's been a trend for many decades as, as and I'm talking to a group of realtors who realized that. And, however, I think, you know, the pandemic and the Zoom town phenomenon has pushed even more people out there. I've seen, those of you who live here probably know how busy the building uh, world is right now. You know, the cost of, of building materials has skyrocketed and, there's a lot of pressure continuing on our wildland urban interface. Next slide, Mel. So we're not gonna have less fires. And in fact, the trend is we have a later fire season in Colorado, it's extended by two months. October 21st was the date of the blow up for East Troublesome. That's pretty late into, into the fall. And in fact, the only thing that put out Cameron Peak and East Troublesome, the state's two new uh, largest fires in history was the snow. And we had a very meager snowpack this year as well, which uh, did not give some of those heavy fuels, those big dead logs and beetle kill stuff that's out there a chance to really bounce back. And with the less snow cover on the ground, if you've been up into, you know, you can, 
I drove to Fulford on a building inspection last week. I could have gone a lot farther. The snow has receded quickly and uh, that's going to dry things out in a bit too. So I would say that we're staring down another fire season in Colorado, at least uh, from the divide west, that uh, similar to 2020. Next slide. The impact to firefighters over the course of this last fire season and, and several it is that of extreme exhaustion and you, you begin to see the cracks in, in the pavement as far as their, their behavioral health is concerned. We've got folks here who spent most of last year responding to a pandemic and working through that who were also then tasked with, with managing large wildfires. And we had, um, you know, in numerous situations, which is always one of the, the tragic ironies of wildfire, um, many, many firefighters who lost their homes to these blazes as well. They were working to protect others, including some uh, close friends of, of mine and possibly yours. Next slide. So again, dun, dun, dun. It can't be overstated the, the threat to our communities in a variety of forms, that of air quality, of, of resource loss, of home loss, of life, of, you know, life safety concerns. And um, we're all working on a variety of levels to address that. And we're going to get into that in a minute, but um, it, we do know time and time again, we'll talk later about some specific examples that mitigation works and that, you know, a, a, another tagline that gets used a lot that I like is that fortune favors the prepared. You saw even in Molly's slides where we're talking about 80% destruction of a town there were still homes in each one of those pictures that were standing there. And that was not by accident. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So I would argue that we can adapt to living with fire and we're going to discuss some of those ways through this um, presentation, specifically the real fire program, which really gets at readying the properties and the owners who live in them throughout wildfire country. Next slide. And again, here we have picture of the destruction in East Troublesome, pretty much put out by heavy snow and that alone. Next slide. Okay, so what are some of the suite of tools that we do use here to address wildfire, um, you know, preparing for wildfires before, during, and after? Uh, we have what's called a CWPP. We also love acronyms, so I'll try my best, but a Community Wildfire Protection Plan is aimed at addressing how to begin to prepare for wild, wildfires entering community based on kind of in its original form a real fuels driven cut the trees here fuel break there defensible space here and um, have melded over the last many years into incorporating things like evacuation planning um, home ignition zone hardening stuff we're going to talk about more and uh, we have community wildfire protection plans in place for the town of Vail, for Cordillera, for the Eagle River Fire Protection District, for Eagle County as a whole, and um, as well as Beaver Creek, Batchelor's Gulch, and Arrowhead. So we have some sub, uh, some kind of sub area plans, some fire district plans, and an overarching community plan. We also have a resilience plan, which is aimed at, well, we have, we have plans on top of plans, and but it, what, what's uh, really important to this conversation is, is you know, how do we take ownership of those? And in the case of this group and, and the, what we, the stakeholders you represent, um, that's looking at the built environment and how we, can, how we can mitigate hazards there. And we also do that through regulatory manner, which is our, our building resolution, which spells out you know, specific mitigation measures based, based on hazard in, in areas of unincorporated Eagle County. There, that our code is unique to Eagle County, but there is a wildland urban interface code, a WUI code, that uh, is that the NFPA Molly that provides that model code. Actually, the NFPA provides standards, but the for wildfire, but the International Code Council provides the International WUI code. So, but they're Thank very you. similar. Mm -hmm. And that's a code package that can be adopted by. Um, you know, a municipality or county government, or, or and there's both getting at the same thing as how do you manage fuels in the built environment? Well, and that's one of the first things I, when I show up on your property and we begin to talk, 
is we realized that from, you know, the fire doesn't distinguish between vegetative fuels and built fuels. What we're looking at is the interaction between the two and how do we keep it from consuming both? That's what's cool about fire is that it, it, it follows the path of combustion and available fuels, not like a, a flood that just comes down the mountain and takes everything out in its path. So uh, further into the, the land use and building code quiver, we have wildfire regulations in place in Eagle County that look at things like, um, you know, subdivision, both large and small, access to communities. Do you have, you know, one or more points of access based on housing density? We look at road grades and widths and available water storage and communications and all that kind of stuff. And then of course, the piece de resistance, the real fire program, which is busier than it's ever been. I just pulled the, the numbers before I jumped on this and I did 60 real fire assessments to date, which is like closing in on what I normally do annually. And then the fire district and others are cranking on that too. So let's talk more about real fire now, Mel. So real fire is our voluntary property assessment program where wherein folks can sign up for an assessment with me or somebody from the fire department in their area and it's primarily an educational tool like especially when you're looking at like this picture here is taken in Vail and what I find in that community it's not necessarily a financial barrier that has people from keeping people from doing the work but they just don't know where to start or what to do or what's available to them other places, it is a financial barrier. Other places, it's kind of, there, there's a lot of, it could be an HOA that's standing in the way and, and we work on all levels to try to remove those barriers and get meaningful mitigation action completed at a local level using the local folks involved. And, and that's a big priority, both with, um, well, with everything we're doing right now is to try to tie the mitigation camp to the suppression folks more directly so that um, we're, working with the knowledge we've developed before the fire when we're putting it out. Next slide. So, uh, and this again, you know, is the, the world that Molly and I work in and we would gladly call ourselves, uh, you know, fire adapted pr practitioners. Building a fire adapted community involves sort of input on all levels. And, and Molly has a great presentation on this. So maybe I'll bring her in a minute, but we're looking at, both people, places, and the all the, the landscape around them. It kind of, we've talked about this wildfire protection planning, accesses for evacuation, what's going on in the built environment, what's going on in the vegetative environment. And we bring those all together for everybody pulling their weight to not necessarily prevent wildfire on the landscape. Let's remember that it has an, its own important role in how ecosystems function, but to like the plants and animals that have been here for so many years before us to be able to become adapted to that impact or another word for that would be resilience. Molly, you wanna quickly say anything else about becoming a fire adapted community since I know this is near and dear to you too. Um, I don't have anything else to add at this moment, Eric, but I definitely will later on in the presentation. You got it, okay. Next slide. I, I was looking to switch the slide. I realized I can't do that. So when we're out working with people, you know, one of the most important things I run into is having that that credibility. Having can you provide either you know anecdotal stuff? I was on this fire and I saw that, or and and can you back it up with with sound science? Can, and those of you who have met with me in the field, you know, I carry on my laptop this Ember video that you're seeing here on this slide, and we talk about it in real time before we start poking around your, your shrubs and mulch so that you can see the impacts of fire in a closed environment like this and, and then picture it across the landscape. And, and there has been a bunch of sound science that goes into home ignitions and, and it's constantly evolving and we try to keep up with that as well. Next. So this concept of a home ignition zone is, is what we're really drilling down on with real fire reports and, and this is a document that's available to you and and Molly will share at the end of this presentation as well and I encourage you to you know post it off and or share it with your clients as well or send them to me but um, we know that what happens in and around the home is is determines whether or not we have an ignition of any kind on the property and if that 
whether it can lend itself to easy suppression by a fire district or a fire department, or um, in some cases, and, and provide an opportunity for the home and property to defend itself back to that fire is looking to consume fuels. And if you manage them appropriately, sometimes you've taken that opportunity away from it. So we call it the home ignition zone, which is the area immediately surrounding the property, including the home. And um, next, we are, Real fire property assessment reports focus on an on site assessment of these each individual properties so that we aren't just handing you out, you know, uh, a cut sheet on here, you know, trees should be 10 feet apart and limbed up six to 10, or firewood on your deck is bad. We're going to kind of talk you through why those are issues. We're going to provide you a site specific assessment of your property and some, some mitigation action that you can work for that that will begin to reduce that hazard. Like, yeah, you need to limb up those trees and get the fire right off your deck or, hey, let's talk about your wood shake roof. And once you work through all of those kind of site specific actions, you're able to achieve a certificate of recognition, which can be valuable to an insurer or a new homeowner or just to your own peace of mind. Next. So we take a, a roof down, walls out approach to all the built and vegetative fuels in the fuelscape that is your property. Look at your roof, we look at the vents, we look at the siding and the attachments, vegetation nearby, um, surrounding area, all the little nooks and crannies where embers could lodge. Next. As well as the trees and shrubs, of course, making sure you've got good separation from, you know, in this case, we're in a ponderosa forest here, type of tree that can burst into flames, but it's also the type of tree that has a host of natural fire adaptions in, that occur, like thick bark and canopies that can burn mostly up and still the tree can survive. So again, we're not trying to exclude fire from the environment. What we're trying to do is lessen its impacts. And in here, in this case, you can see they've thinned and limbed the trees and pulled them back. They've moved firewood piles, they've screened vents, and they've done a bunch of, you know, everything they can in their favor to protect them from the bulk of the fire impacts you're going to see when we talk about stuff like these troublesome and camera peak i don't want to we're not working to that level of fire extreme fire behavior but for 98 99 percent of what we see out there this stuff is extremely effective and molly will get into that later next so people often ask me well you know what are some some common examples of, of things you find out there all the time and of course you see the wood shake roofs in this situation, which I think you've probably heard before that it's problematic when you have a roofing type that provides a place for embers to land and readily ignite the roof covering. It's also an issue if you've got a bunch of brush that comes up underneath your big deck you built for those wonderful views you have, or you stacked a bunch of firewood underneath your, your wooden timbers on your home in Bachelors Gulch, or you buried the area around your house in four to six inches of wood mulch because it looked good, but then you planted some juniper shrubs in it by the decks and the wood walls, or you forgot to get that Christmas tree out. You just pushed it a little bit deeper into the bushes because, you know, this is your second home and you'll deal with it next November. Um, or you didn't screen some vents or that kind of stuff. These are the most common things I see. Next. And that, of course, all goes into your detailed property specific real fire report. And you can mull over it. This also becomes a great kind of laundry list if you're looking to, um, we talked about, you know, technical and financial barriers. For, for me, it's a time barrier. Like my, how much time do I, in the day do I have to drive around and tell people to get rid of their firewood and juniper? I can't get to my juniper when I get home. So it's about having something to uh, provide a contractor maybe to, to get an accurate bid, whether that's for screening vents or flashing in decks or, Junk and juniper. I say it so often, you know, we got a catchphrase. Next. And if it's all done and you can come, this is my real certificate for my real place and you can come check it out if you want. I was just complaining about pulling root balls from juniper shrubs we mixed this spring and, and replacing them with uh, deciduous and perennial flowers. Um, so it's, you know, but trying to practice what I teach. You can come by and check out my house. But in the meantime, next slide. 
here are some examples of certified properties around Eagle County. A couple uh, in Eagle Vale, one down in Homestead, and another one up, uh, where's that, Red Canyon. So none of these homes to me seem, they seem beautiful. They've got lush landscaping. You'll note a lot of places there's aspen instead of conifer. There's brick and stucco and stone instead of wood and wood and wood. Um, so I know that, and I'm not gonna, I'm, I am gonna pick on the realtors a little bit here. I've encountered oftentimes where people, I had a property where they spent a, a considerable amount of time and money cleaning up wood mulch that had been dumped everywhere around the house to cover up holes in the yard and fix some mold. Neglect. So it's like, you know, the beautifying thing. I've seen juniper shrubs planted in front of HVAC in the same name. And, and where I'm going with this is that we can have aesthetically pleasing landscapes and fire adapted communities, uh, that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Next slide. And that takes us to how it went down during Lake Christine and back to Molly. Correct? Um, yeah, so a few years ago, um, the late Christine fire occurred and Eric had, the county had asked the Community Wildfire Planning Center to potentially look at where the burn scar was and look at what fire, uh, what properties were affected by the fire. So we were truly looking at what the potential effectiveness was of wildfire mitigation activities in specific neighborhoods. There's a full report online about this. So we, and in the past, we've, we've done a, a more in-depth presentation on the Lake Christine uh, fire. But really what the study results highlighted through a series of interviews and spatial analysis and a field tour was that there were indeed several properties that were directly threatened by the fire that had either participated in the real fire program or had participated or had been permitted through the county's mitigation uh, requirements and that survived the fire with limited to no firefighter suppression. There were also other properties that had been um, a combination of, they were easier for firefighters to defend because they were well prepared. And so this was for us a very helpful local example of where the fire, where mitigation had made a difference during the fire. Um, and so I wanted to just point this resource out to you. It's available from, I believe the, uh, it's available from the county website as well as the Community Wildfire Planning Center website and we'll post that. And yes, to Diana's question, um, Eric, we certainly have your contact information. And I did want to speak just a few moments about the Real Fire program as well in terms of, Eric, if you don't mind speaking to, for example, the eligibility of who can apply to the program and then um, how the process works for people being in touch with you. Sorry, I had to find the mute button again. Too many screens open. Uh, we do on the realfire.net page have an application that you can fill out and send people there as um, and then I just put my email in the contact or the chat line here contacting me directly or sending your clients to me directly is also an option. I do it will either be me or a firefighter from uh, the Eagle Valley Wildland team which would be Greater Eagle and Eagle River Fire. So in the I-70 corridor you may get somebody from that group or the rest of the place you'll meet with me. Eligibility is just about anybody who lives and resides in Eagle County. So you got, uh, I, I spent a lot of time working with property managers, for example, who are looking after places for folks who are over here for a short period of time each year. I've dabbled briefly into Pitkin, Garfield and Summit counties where we have shared boundaries and, and homes. I can't drive all the way to, to Aspen or Breckenridge, but I can work around the boundaries a little bit. And then as far when we look at cost share assistance, that's gonna be limited to folks in Eagle County. And we do, and the Bail Board of Realtors provided some money for this offer, cost share assistance grants for some folks that are working on their real fire reports. Is that mostly what you wanted me to hit? That's perfect. And then 
when we are in the Q and A discussion part at the end of this, I definitely want to encourage any of you who have um, had any chance to participate in the Real Fire program to share your experiences. So hold that thought. But first, we're going to go next to John and hear more about the insurance perspective on mitigation and wildfire activities. Thanks, guys. Um, next slide. Uh, let's go to the next one, too. So yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit on kind of the current Colorado insurance trends. Uh, I'm sure anybody who owns a house here in Colorado knows uh, in the last like three to five years, homeowners insurance has just absolutely skyrocketed. Um, and there's a couple different reasons for that. Um, the wildfire is obviously one of the driving cost factors. Um, the other one down on the front range, um, we've had just significant hailstorms, you know, replacing roofs, um, you know, year after year, basically down there. Um, and that just really kind of has been driving up insurance costs, as well as just, you know, some companies are looking to, to actually pull out of the state just due to the, the massive losses they've taken year over year. Um, the other thing is just the, you know, the HOA kind of the master policies on townhomes and condos has just, you know, they've seen 20 to 30% increases over the last 12 to 24 months as well, uh, due to the, um, the wildfire areas. Uh, we'll also just kind of talk on, um, you know, a lot like what Eric was talking about, how um, mit mitigation can help. Uh, you can also obviously help save your house, but it'll also just help reduce what's called your brush fire score. Uh, so that can also, you know, save you uh, and also your neighbors uh, some some home insurance premium as well. Uh, next slide, please. And this is somewhat redundant, um, but this is basically talking about the uh, the different home ignition zones, and that's what the the home insurance companies are really going to look at uh, in in developing your brush fire score and deciding ultimately, you know, do we want to offer them a rate? Do we? Is it a little bit too risky? Uh, and each insurance company kind of has a different threshold uh, with the brush score um, and what they're willing to offer um, as far as where it is. And then also just how many homes in that area are they insuring? They just don't want to be too heavy um, in one particular area so that if, you know, take the, um, you know, the Lake Christine fire, if, if that had gone into that neighborhood, if, if say travelers insured 90% of the homes, they're going to take a much larger risk and, you know, whereas if, if each home was insured by a different company. Uh, and then basically the, the most important zone um, is the, the immediate, and that's zero to five feet from the home. Uh, and again, that's, you know, Eric and I are kind of talking about the same thing, um, but you really want to take that, uh, the mulch out, you want to use like crushed sand or stone. A um, lot of what we see, especially around like the HOA buildings are, you know, the trees are, are encroaching on the zero to five to the point where they're almost touching the home, which obviously if if there is a wildfire, that's going to just rip, just you know catch that building and, and unfortunately take out the the condos or townhouses or whatever is touching them. Um, the other thing is just making sure that the the firewood is out of that zone as far as you can get it, basically from the home, um, just because that's usually dried out as well. Um, and then just the landscaping over there as well. Um, the next zone is basically six to 10 feet. Um, and that really goes into the landscaping and maintenance. And a lot of times if you're using a, and this goes to the property managers as well, if you're using a local landscaping company, they usually know how to assess the property as well and kind of clean up, um, you know, trim those trees up to six to eight feet off of the ground so that if there is a fire that can help, that can really help mitigate that risk. Um, and just overall keeping it in good condition. Uh, you know, the branches that fall, uh, you know, shrubs that are dying, they wanna take those out. They can spray trees to keep them, you know, in much better health than others. Um, and the same goes for aspen trees, just cause they can get diseased as well. I know there's been a, a couple articles in the, the paper in the last couple of days touching on that. Uh, and then the next zone is just the extended zone. That can be a little bit tougher. That's 30 to hundred feet away from the house. Uh, and that's just, you know, again, just keeping it clean. Uh, you don't want to have a boatload of trees in that that, that can just kind of push, 
push right on to into the other zones, so to speak. Um, you also, as far as the preparation goes, you just want to make sure that your family has a has a plan to get out. Um, you know, keep all your passports, documents, and a safe that you can just grab and run out the door. Um, and just make a plan. You know, if you if you're at work and your wife's at home and the kids are at home, where are you going to meet up? How are you going to meet up if if you don't have the phones, if the phone systems are down? Um, and that also goes into um, know all the ways out of your neighborhood. Uh, prime example of that's Wild Ridge. It can be a little bit tricky. Um, there's one one primary way in and out, and then there's kind of the other roundabout way to get out of there. And, and you really just want to make sure that all of your family members know how to evacuate safely and as quickly as possible in the event of a wildfire. Um, and if in doubt, you always want to leave on the early side. I mean, you don't want to hang out until if you're worried, you don't want to hang out until you get the knock on the door. I mean, you can always leave early. Um, in your insurance company, there's a there's a clause in your policy that will cover you if you needed to leave and go stay in a hotel um, for the short term, or obviously if you needed to rent a, a home in the long term. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in a couple slides. Um, you also want to create what's called a home inventory log. Um, and different insurance companies actually have apps for that now, where you can walk around the house, take pictures of your belongings, uh, and just make sure that you have everything logged. That way, if you know if there was a fire event and you did lose everything, uh, it's a lot easier to go back to your insurance company and say, hey, you know, I had this in my laundry room, I had this in my living room, and my dining room. Um, and it just makes kind of the, the rebuilding process a little bit easier. Another thing that you can do for that uh, is just walk around with a video camera or your, you know your phone and take a video of each room. I always advise my clients to do that anyway, uh, just because you do tend to forget kind of the smaller things. You might forget, you know, the the piece of art in your office or you know the the antique collection that you had in the dining room. Um, and the video, as you're looking back through it, that can really help to kind of jog those memories and make sure that you're getting reimbursed for everything that you uh, that you actually had. Um, and then finally, you really just want to do an annual insurance review um, every time you get your renewal. Um, just make sure, one, that you're properly covered. I mean, I know we had, somebody had touched on earlier, the, uh, the cost of building supplies up here in the last year has just absolutely skyrocketed. Um, and that really just dives right back into uh, the dwelling amount on your insurance policy. You really want to make sure that that reflects the changes in the, in the local market. Um, the other thing is, you know, some insurance companies are raising deductibles to try to offset the uh, the costs, and you want to make sure that that you're reading your renewal and making sure that you didn't get you know go from a thousand dollar deductible to a a one percent deductible or something too crazy that that would make you come out of pocket a lot more to rebuild your house. Um, let's go to the next slide, and this is basically just going on the um, construction of the house, which is really going to help you um, help your insurance costs, and then obviously you know help to ensure that your house can hopefully survive a wildfire. Um, class A is pretty much the, the gold standard as far as the building materials for that. Um, the roofing and vents, uh, you know, metal roofing obviously is right up there on the best. Um, composite shingles, concrete or clay tiles, uh, those are usually the most expensive out of those. Um, but that's ultimately, you know, every insurance company when they're doing the quote, that's the first thing that they look at. Um, of the 10 or so companies up here that I can write for, I know, you know, there's only a handful that will still even cover a wood shake roof. Um, they're really trying to get away from that just from a, you know, a cost perspective, as well as, you know, if your house was to go up, it can also just, you know, it, it's bad for the whole neighborhood. Whereas if, if your wood shake roof catches, those embers can go right over to your neighbor's property, it's your neighbor's house. Um, so the, the wood shake, you really, you really want to have a, a look at if you still have that. Um, the decks and porches, the same thing. You, you really don't want to store flammable material underneath of it. Um, but if you're in a in a, a, a wildfire prone area, you also just in, in building that you want to get away from the two by fours and use more more timber, uh, like a six by six, just because that's it can withstand a lot more heat um, and it takes a lot more to to make those kind of flame up a lot quicker. Uh, and then the next thing is the siding and windows. Um, 
you want to definitely make sure that you have double paned windows. Uh, the, the single panes tend to crack very easily when the when the heat goes um, comes up to it. Uh, and then also all the vents and the soffits around your house, you want to make sure that you have some some screens or some some covering on that just to to make sure two things that you know dirt and debris aren't coming in there all year long. Uh, but also just that embers can't blow in there and ultimately start a fire once you know a wildfire is in your area. And that also um, goes for the decks and porches. You just want to make sure that you have um, fencing or some kind of a metal, you know, metal material underneath to to block it out and keep it, keep the debris, keep the leaves, all that fun stuff that everybody loves to clean every year out of there as well. Um, next slide, please. So this is the um, home ignition checklist, and you can kind of take this um, and walk through your house and just do a, a quick um, study. And I'm sure Eric probably uses a lot of these if, if you were to call him to come out for the um, for his review as well. Um, we also, some insurance companies are coming out with apps. Um, Liberty has one, it's called like the Dwell Being. And what that does actually, every quarter, it'll just ping your phone with, with kind of the quarterly checklist. Um, the big ones here, you know, clean the roofs and gutters of dead leaves, debris, pine needles. Um, that's very important for wildfire, but it's just kind of good home maintenance. You don't want those gutters overflowing and, and all that type of stuff. Um, you want to replace or repair any loose shingles. The reason for that is if embers, if there is a wildfire in, in the area, um, that asphalt roof, if an ember lands on it, it's going to be able to, you know, it's not going to catch right away. Whereas if you're missing a shingle and that ember lands on the tar paper underneath or the wood, uh, that can pose a much more serious problem. Um, and then you wanna clean the exterior attic vents and then that was the metal mesh, which I was talking about. Each home, every home has soffits in the attic uh, and you just wanna make sure that they're clear. I'm sure everybody's seen those houses with the, you know, kind of on the side of the garages with those broken eaves and, and kind of ways right into the attic. You wanna avoid that. Uh, from a wildfire and obviously from a from a pest control standpoint as well. Uh, you want to just you, the screened in the areas under the patios, just kind of any open area where leaves, dead leaves and stuff like that can blow right up to your house uh, just because of an ember were to land in there. That's a again a huge huge problem. Um, and that is about it on that slide. Next slide, please. And on this one, this is basically a policy declarations page for a client that we did um, over in Singletree about six months ago. Um, and the most important parts on this, if, you, if you're looking at the coverage information spot about you know three quarters of the way down the page, uh, coverage A is the dwelling amount. And that's what I, I touched on earlier that you really, really wanna make sure that you're up to date on that, especially if you've had the same home insurance company for you know 10 years. Um, just because of the cost of goods with the cost, I'm sure everybody's right about the cost of lumber, um, but it really, I mean, even the cost of labor up here, it's just so hard to get contractors to come and, and fix stuff. Um, you wanna make sure that your dwelling amount will definitely be enough to cover the replacement of your home. Uh, and if you look at that with the expanded replacement cost, uh, what that is most companies will offer anywhere from 20 to 50% of expanded replacement costs, meaning, that's kind of a buffer that they put in there for the extra cost of labor and goods. If it were to shoot up, if um, if there was a, a massive wildfire where it put an even bigger crunch on the, on the cost of goods and labor, that can kind of help you in that situation as well. Um, coverage B is other structures. That's just anything not physically attached to the house. So if you have a shed, um, even a fence, but particularly if you have like a guest house, um, stuff like that, uh, you want to make sure that you've talked to your agent about that, and that's properly covered under that that um, part of the policy. Uh, coverage C, personal property, that's just everything that you're going to physically move into or out of that house. So couches, TVs, clothing, um, you know, pots and pans, everything. Uh, and that can add up really quickly. The other thing, the other important part of the policy with that is the replacement cost coverage. Um, some companies, or if you're just trying to get, you know, the, the least expensive policy out there, um, both with the dwelling and the personal property, they'll put what's called actual cash value. Uh, meaning if you've had, let's say you bought a TV 
five years ago for a hundred dollars, they're going to depreciate that and say, well, you know, it's worth you know fifty dollars today type thing. Um, whereas if it's replacement costs, they'll just come out and cut you a check for what you bought it for and replace that you know fifty inch TV with a fifty inch TV today. Um, coverage D. That's also a very, very, and often overlooked part of the policy, the loss of use of insured location. Uh, that's what I was talking about earlier. If you and your family had to flee or evacuate uh, from a wildfire, your insurance company is gonna pay to rent you a hotel room uh, in the short term until we can get you back into that house until the, the danger is cleared. Uh, or in the event that you did lose your house, they're gonna pay to rent you a comparable house uh, until yours is rebuilt. And if you look at the limit on that, it just says actual loss sustained. Uh, that to me is very really important just because it gives you peace of mind that you're not gonna run out of money and you know, renting a comparable house. Uh, it can very often take two years to build a house. I'm sure you know, all of us know that, especially the realtors. Um, but it can be a very time consuming process. And some of the companies, again, if, if you're looking for just the least expensive premium, they'll cut that down to even you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, which, again, I'm sure we all know up here. You know, might rent you a place for a couple months, but that's about it. Um, and you really, again, you just don't. Being in a wildfire is stressful enough. You don't want to stress out about having to pay the mortgage and you know take care of your family at the same time. Um, but that, for me, is about all I have from the insurance standpoint. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Molly for looking ahead. Great. Thanks so much, John. So in this last section, we wanted to share some broader trends related not just to insurance, but other uncertainties that we're experiencing related to wildfire. Uh, next slide. So as we started out in this lecture, we talked about, oh, I'm sorry, I had a different next slide and I'm not, well, why don't we stay on that slide? Um, Mel, if you don't mind the first one that was there. Yeah, it looks like maybe we have, I have a slightly different version here. Okay, thanks. So as we started out in this lecture, um, wildfire activity in the US is changing rapidly, particularly in the West. Um, we know conditions are becoming hotter and drier. We're seeing, as Eric mentioned earlier, snow melt, higher temperatures, higher sustained temperatures in the summer drier soils and vegetation. So there are many uh, parts in Western Colorado that are in an extreme drought, as Eric mentioned, and other states are also in, in dire shape. So um, some areas in California, for example, have the lowest level of fuel, fuel moisture that's ever been recorded um, since they've been taking records. So these, these factors are extending what we have traditionally thought of as fire season. And in fact, no one really refers to fire season anymore, at least in our business, because fire season feels like it could be year round. Um, next slide. So it's not just the climate alone, though, that we are concerned about, or that I should say is shaping how wildfire affects us. We have experienced a lot of growth over the past several decades across Colorado and across other Western states in areas referred to as we've used this term, the wildland urban interface. And that's really in a very simple sense, an area where there's vegetation and structures. So this map shows grow the growth rate of homes in the wildland urban interface or the WUI between 1990 and 2010 by county. Uh, the darkest shade is where there has uh, been more than a 75% increase. So you can see in Colorado that really lines up more so, not just on the front range where we always traditionally think about growth, but in many other counties in western and northern and southern southwestern parts of the state. So in all, Colorado is projected to continue growing with a population growth rate that's projected of 40% by 2050. And not all of this is going to occur in the front range. Now the front range does have wildfire hazard, uh, but for the purposes of today's discussion, I just want to underscore that you know we're, we expect to continue seeing growth in, in wildfire prone areas. Next slide. And wildfire is really catching up to these development trends. So we're, we're now starting to see this confluence of where there's been 
um, development where wildfire, we're, we're, we're in this drought where wildfire is becoming more of an issue. Um, an analysis in 2018 showed that during the same time period where we were um, where we were growing, there were also more houses being added to the same, the very same areas that were um, have experienced fire before. So, in other words, the fire perimeters, the known fire perimeters that have been on our landscape, we've been building and rebuilding in, and so we're not necessarily um, redirecting growth away from some of these areas. And the statistics really show this. So between the last 15 years, 2005 and 2020, um, we had 89, more than 89,000 structures that were destroyed by wildfires. You know, prior to that period, over the course of the decades before that, we had nowhere near those numbers. And so it's not just a proportion of there's more, there's more homes. Uh, there are also more wild, there's greater wildfire activity. Next slide. So this is really the drought, um, you know, the, the drought slide that I wanted to get at as we are in some ways entered some uncharted territory. Um, some scientists are referring to this now that we're in a mega drought, that we haven't seen something along the lines of this for 500 plus years. So I think it really is taking us to a place of you know, not what we're experiencing now is not what we've experienced in the past. And yet we use oftentimes um, historic data to guide our decisions. So we really need to kind of look forward in a, in a more creative way of how to prepare for something that we may have not experienced yet. Next slide. So this also um, brings up some larger issues that our communities are struggling with um, uh, and, and other uncertainties. We know many other communities also have housing affordability challenges. And so the question obviously becomes, it's, it's not as black and white as saying, just don't build there because, you know, as, as you may be familiar with when you look at wildfire maps, well, if you look across the state and in other states, Wildfire is actually quite, um, as a hazard, pervasive across many states. So I really always shy away from saying, well, there's just going to be large areas that we can't build in because that's not realistic. Ironically, though, um, just today in the New York Times, it may have been out in the past few days, but just recently in the New York Times, I read an article about some recent recommendations that California is considering uh, to really put some additional pressure on local officials about being more selective about where new homes can be built, even if that means, you know, cutting off some of the state support that they had received through their state insurance program, which was really an, an, meant to be an insurance of last resort, but now many, many um, residents rely on. So the state is looking at if there are some areas where climate risk is simply too high now for state dollars to be used to support new development and infrastructure or rebuilding. And that's, again, just very much at the recommendation phase. But um, I think we're seeing California on the front end of where other states may be at in the future in terms of some of the issues and challenges that will be, you know, very much um, front and center. Next slide. So uh, another issue that we confront in all of this is that we do know more now of how to build for new homes. Um, we have the science, as Eric talked about, to direct where, um, where to where and how, or excuse me, how to build with the right materials and the right construction techniques. Um, the, a larger challenge though is also what do we do with all of the existing structures that are out there? Next slide. And not just the existing structures themselves, but the infrastructure like roads and driveways or water systems that were not built up to what today we may consider as minimum standards. So you know, there's many areas and communities I go to across the country where it's surprising when I hear a firefighter tell me 
it would take sometimes up to an hour just to respond to a certain area and they're not sure if they could do it safely. Um, and so th those really raise a lot of concerns when I think about, you know, longer term trends. You know, I, I think that the real fire program and some of the insurance measures that John talked about are really starting to get at how can we address existing structures and give them incentives and, and uh, very successful ways of addressing risk on their property. When it comes to that larger community, and Eric was talking about fire adapted communities, when it comes to the larger community approach, that's really where you know, the most successful communities we see are those communities that have worked together and it takes long standing, dedicated, sustained commitment, not just funding, but interest from local community members to engage in conversations and work with their local fire districts or departments, um, work with state agencies to get resources, work with federal partners when there's a national forest nearby or BLM land. So it's really, um, it's, it's, a, it's not a one, one way to do this. It's a multiple multifaceted approach that's required for where we see communities having the most success to um, move wildfire risk reduction forward. Next slide. So there are a lot of unknowns in terms of where we're headed with the future and where we see communities being affected and rebuilding um, and some of the trends that may shape this. So one of the, um, one of the uncertainties is to the extent to which um, in not just insurability, but real or perceived um, wildfire risk concerns will affect the real estate market. So our organization has done some research to date, just looking at some examples, uh, studies, I should say, where there were uh, effects on the housing prices in areas that had been in that had experienced wildfires and it's the results are conflicting right now so some studies have shown that uh, the real estate market really did get affected there was a, a small decrease but significant enough um, percentage in the uh, value gained in a home as in a real in a wildfire prone area as compared with homes that were outside of a wildfire prone area this was in California. So in that study, there was an, an impact on real estate um, val or home values in those areas that were affected by wildfires. However, we've seen in other areas where that there may have been some impact, but it was either temporary or in other cases there was no impact at all. So it's really hard to say right now, um, at least from purely a, a home buyer preference standpoint, if we're seeing any trends that are affecting real estate. However, we and we don't have a, enough data on this yet, but we are starting to see anecdotally across multiple states where the cost of insurance is becoming more of a is a true concern for residents and affordability. Next slide. So I just wanted to leave with some other unknowns and we're going to transition then into questions and discussion, but I wanted to share a few other unknowns that we're tracking, but we really don't have enough information on yet. Um, we do know or we're seeing and hearing about anecdotally um, with the digitalization of work and even commerce, you know, preferences for people wanting to work more or live remotely from where they work. Um, we haven't, we don't have enough long term data, though, to know if there really is an exodus from urbanized areas into more of these wildland urban interface, you know, semi-rural or rural areas. Um, we see it happening, but we also see housing pressure in urban areas as well. So we're just not yet sure if there is a true migration pattern away from cities that would be sustained over time, not just maybe a blip from the pandemic. Um, so that's one thing definitely that I'm sure many of you are interested in. We're interested in from a wildfire standpoint, but at least we're not aware of any studies yet that are more conclusive um, from a more universally representative standpoint of these trends. Um, 
We also don't know how things like or um, activities like where there has been more wildfires recently, for example, like in California, um, even away from wildfires themselves, if and how smoke impacts are, may start to affect um, people and residents, if that will drive people away from some areas. So that's very difficult to predict because as we all know, many areas far away from a fire could be impacted from smoke. So we are aware that these are challenges for people, but it's not, there's not enough evidence yet to also show where wildfires may be affecting, even though we're starting to see the, the fatigue from evacuation, um, annual evacuations in some communities or the smoke that's affecting them. There's so there's really a lot of interesting things um, that we're paying attention to, but we just don't have quite enough information yet on how these trends may affect uh, wildfire and development preferences and uh, lifestyle preferences. So as we close out here, I wanted to just give a few moments to our speakers, um, Eric and John, to add any additional thoughts or questions to our entire um, panel discussion or our panel topics that we presented. And then we'll turn to Mike, uh, Bud, who's with us today to add any additional perspectives since Mike has been working with us for many years on the Real Fire program, as well as other VBR wildfire activities. And then we'll open it up for a discussion. And um, Mel, I know we do have our contact slide on the last page. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we were able to share that as well. Thank you. So um, Eric, why don't we turn to you first and then we'll go to John. Sure, uh, I'll keep it real brief. I think we've, we've covered it all very well. Um, just that we have increased capacity both here at Eagle County, I am bringing on help and then so is the fire district and that all lends to more people out there doing what we're doing and trying to connect with more folks in the interface. So please call or, or email is always the best way to contact me. Thanks, John. Yeah, no, um, the only thing I'd really add is, you know, the, like what Molly said, the insurance costs are, are just, you know, really skyrocketing and, and kind of worrying people for sure. Um, if you have clients who are looking to put offers in on houses or just looking at a couple of different houses, um, I always advise my clients to call me first um, just to get, you know, a, a initial rough quote on that property, just to one, make sure that we can insure it and then, you know, estimate what the cost is and you can roll that into your mortgage. Um, and also just, you know, we can run a clue report and say, hey, you know, this, this roof was recently replaced or, you know, any questions that the underwriters might have, we can put up front and then you can ask the, um, the sellers or the selling agent that um, throughout the contract process. So that kind of, you know, can speed it up and also just kind of give your buyers a little bit more confidence and, uh, in the property that they're, that they're purchasing. Perfect. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. And Mike, why don't we turn to you and then we'll open it up for a discussion with everyone. Okay, am I uh, unmuted? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay, um, maybe just a little bit of history for all of us that are practitioners of real estate. VBR, uh, began to become involved in this process. Uh, basically, uh, after a September 2013 um, 57-page report was put on the governor's desk with um, a plan that, that would, was proposed to be a statewide plan, and pretty much, and you know, the, the essence of the actions are many of the actions that we've talked about today and whatnot, but there was one caveat that uh, was a real shocker to those of us in the real estate industry, and that was if we, if you were about to close on a property, you would have to, prior to the closing, if you needed to move or change that cedar shake roof, if you needed to cut down trees, clear defensible space, et cetera. All of those things would have to be done prior to closing. 
uh, as a mandatory regulation. Uh, we didn't feel that that was in our private property owner's best interest. We certainly want them to do the mitigation, but we thought a voluntary program that could be done over time was a better way. Hence the move to get together with Molly and Kelly Johnson and the BBR crew. Uh, what can we do? How can we address it? Uh, at that time, down in Boulder County, the county had a program extremely similar to what we ended up with at Bright, or as really what we we're doing with Real Fire. However, the difference was the people had to pay for the assessment and whatnot. We wanted to take another route and incentivize the people to do it, which was to not charge for the assessment. And we were kind enough to tell the Boulder group that emulation was one of the most sincere forms of flattery, but we were gonna do a program similar to theirs, but uh, Kelly and Molly worked to create a software package and uh, program that was much simpler and easier to operate on and keep track of assessments, mitigation, et cetera. And um, at that particular juncture, Eric got involved with us so that the county along with VBR became involved. And this goes back to really 2014 was beginning to get this thing rolling. And uh, as we move back from there, we've been doing it. And for those of us who were involved with it at the VBR structure at that point, it gave us exposure to wildfire programs all over the state with many of the different fire districts, traveling to a lot of the different uh, conventions and meetings and whatnot, and learning about wildfire per se. And uh, one of the most enlightening things that I was exposed to at one of these was a video called The Era of Megafires. And what that, what that did was directly uh, relate to what we've been seeing today about the magnitude of fires and the increased viability of fires, along with the devastation of these fires. So that really brings us to here in Eagle County, we have about, you know, there's only about 13 to 14% of the total acreage in Eagle County that's privately owned. The rest is all owned by the National Forest, State Forests, or the BLM. So a huge mega fire in any of those areas is certainly a potential risk to our private property owners. And we can, uh, on a PUD basis, tr try and create fire breaks but when you see the wind carriage of embers and things that can occur, you begin to realize that it's also very important to get the individual property owners to work on some form of reasonable mitigation. And we, since we started that, we've watched the state of Colorado uh, realtor organizations and whatnot all over the state doing different things. We have a real fire program uh, that's in the, on the verge of kicking off down in Jefferson County and uh, the Evergreen area and whatnot. We've been working with seven counties on the Western Slope on a real fire type program. Um, there are other, for, oh, go back to Boulder for a second. They liked our software so well, they are now, as to the best of my knowledge, utilizing our software package in lieu of what they previously had uh, with their program. So those are things that are happening uh, through CAR. There are a number of other programs where they range from uh, really uh, different types of chipping programs uh, in 
different areas to Route County, which has a very progressive involvement with the county, the, fed, the Forest Service and whatnot on mitigation programs and everything. So over the last seven years, effectively, we've seen a huge realtor involvement. And the good news is it's all still voluntary. And we as realtors we are not going to be held responsible as we would have in the proposal back in 2013 of having to validate that all the remediation had been done before we could go to the closing table. And I don't think any one of us would ever want to be in that position. Uh, but that was where that was really the catalyst to this. And uh, we've got a lot of active things going on with uh, within the state of Colorado, CAR and local boards. And VBR uh, definitely has been one of the leaders in a lot of this moving forward. And the single biggest issue we need is volunteers. We need you folks to reach out to your HOAs, to your PUD if necessary, whatever. Uh, Eric and I used to laugh about the Eric and Mike show back in the early days, and we were making presentations to uh, Eagle Vale, Singletree, Homestead, and getting involvement from those entities in the private property assessment and mitigation. We need more of that. We need more of y'all working on that. And finally, last thing, I've learned probably more about wildfire than I ever expected in my life. I've even learned most of the acronyms, which I had sworn when I got out of the army, I would never use acronyms again, but I have learned a lot of them. And our valley from an east to west, we can have different forms of fire dangers from the south side to the north side. If we go down you know, up in Vale, it's coniferous forests on both sides within a few hundred yards of each other. As you move down valley, you can have coniferous forests on the south side and high desert on the north side, different types of fire scenarios. So being able to personalize it makes it a huge benefit to our property owners. So that being said, wasn't planning on speaking, just spoke too long and I'll get off. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, we do have a quick, a first question from Tina from a few moments ago, asking John, if someone gets their house certified by Real Fire, would they see a discount in their insurance premiums? Yeah, so basically we're still working with the every all the big underwriting companies, all the big insurance companies um, to get the actual certificate to um, qualify them for the discount. Um, but I will say now, even you know, if Eric comes out and gives you a, a basically a to-do list to clean up the property. Um, all everything that you do, we can I can take back to the underwriters and say, hey Tina, um, you know she did she cleaned up the mulch around her house. Um, we moved the firewood out. We did this, that, and the other. Um, and that is what I touched on before. Going to up your or lower your brush fire score, which is a in a direct correlation to what you're going to pay for your homeowner's insurance. Um, so even now before we can you know send the actual certificate in just to say that you did it um we can send pictures just saying hey these steps have already been taken uh and 99 percent of the time that's gonna lower your insurance premium um but i'd say you know all these companies are you know fortune 100 companies so getting to the right person to to have them approve that discount is a little bit easier said than done um, I've already had conversations and you kind of get, you know, kicked around the room to, you know, well, email this person, call this person. They're kind of, you know, more in charge. Well, we need to talk about it at this meeting. Um, but we've already started those steps. And I'd say hopefully by the end of the summer that we, we will have at least one company on who says, Hey, yes, if they have that certificate, you know, we'll, we'll honor the discount. Um, but even now with the steps that he's going to recommend, you're going to see a lower homeowner's insurance premium. Great. Thanks. Great. Other questions that anyone has that you want to, you can just, we, we have a small enough group where you can talk um, here or you can enter something in the chat as well. 
Quick question for the group. Um, which areas in Eagle County are the highest risk for the wildland sort of urban interface uh, fire danger? We have a wildfire hazard map, Tim, that I'll put a link to in this uh, chat page where you can check that out. It varies depending on a variety of things, but what the map is going to point to is sort of the risk to the urban interface. So it'll pin down areas where there um, is vegetation that loans itself to rapid fire spread, also with steep slopes, uh, south facing aspects, and high parcel density, just to name a few. It's kind of a convoluted algorithm and GIS thing, but I'll put the link up to that map and, and you can check it out for yourself. Thank you. And I'll touch on one other thing with that is um, what Molly was saying, the, the drive time from the fire stations, uh, a lot of insurance companies look at that as well. Um, I know, you know, Red Sky is one example where it, it takes a really long time to get up there uh, with a lot of fuels up there. Uh, so that can be another kind of tricky obstacle, depending on, you know, where in Eagle County you are, where the, where the closest fire station is. And just as a follow-up question, I mean, areas like, like you mentioned, like a Red Sky or a Cordillera or, you know, Single Tree Wild Ridge, places like this that have, I mean, really only one legitimate way to get out. I mean, I guess you could drive up on a four-wheel drive road and get out. Um, what do we need to know in terms of like talking with our family about evacuation and an emergency situation and things like this? And um, that, that just can, those, those types of scenarios really worry me for the Valley. Sure. Well, there are many, many communities in Eagle County that are one way in and one way out. And that's largely uh, the result of the fact that we live in a mountainous resort community and the bulk of the private property is, is pushed down into the bottom of the valley. It's also the result of poor design and things like subdivision exemption that um, we don't necessarily see the overall plan for an area, say like with 35 acre or larger parcels until it's already built out. So what I would say first is everybody on this call, please make sure you were signed up for EC alert. And if you spend a lot of time in say the Roaring Fork Valley, you should probably do Pitkin alert too. And that way you can, and then with the Everbridge system as well, so that we can notify you on all of your devices and tablets and, and so on. Because as somebody said earlier, we want you gone well before somebody's knocking at your door. And what I tell people when we talk about this in the field is to have, you know, you have your primary way out and have some contingency plans. And that might be, you know, out of back road through a neighboring community that might be staying in, in a large like soccer field or community park area until you can move through. It definitely means working closely with emergency responders and law enforcement to coordinate that evacuation. But um, think of it as, you know, a game. Who's the first one out wins? Don't hang around. Make sure you've, you're notified. And but some parts of Eagle County have limited uh, cell phone coverage too. So I talked to people about having having trigger points and things in their mind that don't rely on one of uh, on emergency providers to give you an evacuation notice. Last year on Labor Day, we had a small fire about a mile from my house in E.B. Creek. And once I had the car packed up on the pre-evac notice and take those pre-evacuation notices seriously, that's your chance to give it some time and thought and get out of there first. Go if you're uncomfortable, don't wait and that's what I told my younger son who was pretty nervous. I'm like, okay, you're my lookout. You see fire on this point of the ridge, we're gone. And that kind of kept him busy too. So community, you know, signed up for emergency alerts, family planning, know your neighborhood, have a primary and a secondary route. If you're in a neighborhood like Wild Ridge where there is legitimately only one way in and one way out, have an idea of what a safety zone that you could ride it out temporarily would look like, but make sure you're working with me or with the fire district to identify those things. I might just jump in and mention, Tim, the uh, single tree as an example has two points of access and egress, the Winslow Road underpass and the west entrance. Cordillera went through on the summit and made an agreement with Diamond Star Ranch for emergency egress. Up there, Wild Ridge regretfully still is 
one point of access and egress, but as Eric says, most of these are developments that were approved way back before we were focused on wildfire. But uh, you know, currently, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, Eric, the basic requirement is supposed to be two points of access and egress on any new approved PUDs, correct? Yeah, but we allow for a variance to that process wherein we can do things in lieu of dual access because it's not always the best situation. A lot of times I work for water storage or interior fire roads or other mitigating factors that when it's just a, a matter of the mountains in the way or ownership, be it private or public, precludes the that secondary access. But I do also spend a lot of time working on easement agreements and secondary stuff out of various communities, particularly in the Roaring Fork where they all went through this and it's very much in the front of their attention. I think we could uh, we could look at more backdoor exits to several communities in the Edwards area in particular. <clears throat> Tim, That's does that answer your question? And I do have the map, the wildfire map link in the chat now. Thank you very much. And Eric, the only thing I might add to that, if you want to touch on, I know you touched on this when we were talking about real fire, but, and it's a little bit different than Tim's question, just recognizing the difference between the hazard that you can see on the, the countywide map versus the individual parcel level susceptibilities that when you go out and do an assessment, you know, you may have a parcel that's in a moderate area of the county, but yet it still could have a lot of concerns. And that's really the value of one of the values of the real fire program is that you can, you can drill down to that scale that you can't get to from the countywide map. Yeah, that's right. Look at things like, and there's also, it occurs to me, there is the Colorado Forest Atlas, the CORAP project in the State Forest Service. Molly, maybe when I'm talking, you can put that link in there, which will get, these are all just aimed at providing you kind of a 10,000 foot view of, it'd be your first place to look at, hey, what's the overall wildfire hazard in Wild Ridge or Single Tree, for example? And then you can start to think, okay, well, where's my house in relative relationship to that? And you're like, I'm not convinced that the polygons on this map line up with what I feel. Then you call me, Jeff Seckman, or one of our assessors, and we come out and we and we walk you through it. And and I don't, I mean, I've been to properties in the flanked by golf course fairway and Eagle Vale and Single Tree where we've readily identified ember concerns. And and I've been to places in the top of Web Peak and Cordillera that um look pretty good. And we've lost homes in quote unquote low and moderate hazard areas and saved them in high. So it's really, these are educational tools meant to get you thinking about what is my exposure on a community and an individual level. And ultimately we want you or your clients getting us on site to, to dig into it. To you know, I can't use a GIS model to determine if you have firewood on your deck or your gutters are filled with pine needles, right? We need to be there to talk about that kind of stuff and that one-on-one -on -one interaction is so important to motivating people, I believe. Thanks, Eric. Other questions or comments? I'm also curious if any of you have, if or how you've heard about the Real Fire program. We wanna make sure it's really clear now what it is. And so please, you know, if it's not crystal clear, um, just jump in and we're happy to clarify. We want to make sure, you know, you're, you are aware of how to be a messenger if it comes up as a question or if there's an opportunity to share more information with any of your potential home buyers or home sellers even. Uh, we want to make sure you feel prepared for that. Molly, one thing everybody uh, said this past Saturday, Page A16 of the Vale Daily had a full page article on the Real Fire program and whatnot. It may be worth getting a copy, you know, just getting it off of the uh, website and having it available to show to your clients. Thanks, Mike. 